So welcome to another episode of From the Studio, stories from the world of product design, innovation, and much more. I'm your podcast host, Nick Bramley, and my fellow studio co-host is Richard Hall. We're delighted to introduce our guest today, Dr. Peter Kulmer. Peter's an associate professor at the University of Leeds for healthcare mechatronics. We're going to be talking about all things soft robotics. So without further ado, welcome to the uh, podcast, Pete. Hi there, Nick. Hi, Richard. Pleased to join you. And welcome, Richard, as our co-host. Hi. Hi. Looking forward to this one. Excellent. So am I. So why don't we crack on for the benefit of our audience? So, um, so Pete, soft robotics. Um, it seems to be now a very established subfield of um, more traditional robotics. Um, when did it sort of start to evolve? And, um, and I guess, what was the catalyst for the evolution of this particular area as a subfield? Well, it's an interesting one. I, I, I looked at this and um, it feels like it's been around a long time, but actually the, the, sort of the, the term soft robotics was coined about 2008. Um, now it's considered one of the most rapidly growing areas of robotics, um, but clearly it hasn't been around for that long. Um, and it, the real catalyst for this was, I guess, uh, traditional robotic systems. Um, you might think of a, a car plant, for, for instance, a, a robot which is um, big, mechanical, very rigid. So that's a conventional robot system, um, typically built out of uh, non-flexible materials. Um, and the, the big catalyst for soft robotics was, can we have systems which can um, adapt to their environment better? Um, so that might be interacting with humans, or it might be um, navigating different environments. Um, but all of the things you think of as biological organisms, as a human, if you grasp something, your skin isn't rigid, but it deforms. And that gives you a really useful set of features to interact with those objects, like a coffee cup, for instance. So soft robotics is driven a lot by wanting to kind of operate and engage with the environment of the real world more effectively. Um, particularly the uncertainties that can arise in the, in the real world. If everything's not precise, then you need to have systems which can adapt to it. And soft robotics, inherently being soft, they can adapt to their environment better. Excellent. It, I mean, it sounds fascinating. We are going to explore quite a bit of this over the, uh, over the podcast episode. Um, how did you first get into it? And, and, and what was attractive to this particular discipline for you? So I, I did um, a degree at uh, University of Leeds, and that was in mechatronics, which is, you can think of that as like the, the fundamentals of robotics. And then I went on to do a, a PhD looking at rehabilitation systems for people who had stroke. Um, and we were looking at a robotic system that could take somebody's arm and move it through a series of exercises um, to aid rehabilitation. So one of the observations I made during that PhD, we had a, a robotic arm which was rigid and we were trying to engage with somebody whose arm was very soft and compliant and you need to move them around. So there's a real discrepancy between the two things. And you, my job in that PhD was to, to program the robot to move in a way which was not going to hurt the patient, but was going to adapt to their movements and help them through a series of tasks. So that kind of insight and seeing the realities of how robots have to interact with people. That's what kind of gave me that spark, that kind of, um, that want to kind of investigate this area more. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in my research in healthcare. Um, and so in healthcare, obviously things need to interact with the human body on a day-to-day -day basis. And so soft systems um, seem absolutely the way to go. So that's, that's kind of how I found myself here today. Okay, so what year are we talking about when you did your sort of PhD into that particular first, it sounds like the first foray into soft robotics for you? Yeah, so I was looking around sort of 2003, 2004, I started off the PhD and finishing up in 2007. So it was in that kind of interim where some of the technology maybe for soft robotics was starting to emerge, but the, the full, you know, what you, what you call the field of soft robotics, um, wasn't fully established yet, um, but we were already seeing things like um, soft materials being used more extensively. And um, in terms of actuators, the things that make robots move, um, 
you might sort of traditionally think of things like motors and gearboxes, um, pneumatic systems are often used in soft robotics, um, particularly because they can be, they lend themselves to being compliant and soft. Uh, so filling air chambers, um, which are compliant with pressurized gas allows them to move and behaves a little bit like a, a muscle on a human. So wow. some of those as aspects are really fascinating and, and they had started to emerge at that same time. But I suspect the uh, pace of change has been not gradual, but fairly significant over the years. Uh, where, where are we in headline format now with the whole kind of um, uh, field, I guess, of, of soft robotics? I think it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's really kind of rapidly accelerating and you're probably seeing the transition now from, um, as an academic, obviously, we look at how these, are, how these systems are researched and developed and lots of focus has been on things like how you design them, um, how you put things like sensors into them, how you control them. Um, and there's lots of work to be done to understand those processes because unlike a, say, a rigid robot or mechanical structure, there's a lot more complexity. If you think of something you can stretch, uh, stretch and move around, um, you need to be careful about how you design that in order, to, in order for it to do the right job. So there's lots of focus on the designing um, an effective soft robot. But I think now we're getting to the point where we're starting to see the applications. So the translation of what was a piece of research or a research field into the real world. Um, some really interesting examples are maybe if you think about um, manipulation. So how, you, how a robot system could pick up an object. Um, if you have a rigid grasper, it's fine as long as everything is very uniform and is the same each time. If you have a, a deformable grasper, it's able to adapt to its environment much better. And we're starting to see robots with soft graspers that can adapt to different size objects or positioned objects. Uh, and they're used in the real world now. So things like Amazon, you know, they have absolutely driven and been a, a pull for some of that technology because they, they have huge warehouses where they need to shift things, which are all shapes and sizes. So you can sort of see the real world translation coming in now. Must be great to see the transition from research to, to real world applications over that time. And I'm assuming there's been a, a, a big development in sort of soft tissue materials as well that, that helped the whole process from, you know, early days to, to, to you know, what, what's coming next, etc. Yeah, absolutely. The, the material side of it is, is crucial, really. So in our lab, we use a lot of silicons, um, polymers um, that you can define the properties of to some extent. So you can make them more or less soft um, and you can also cast them into different shapes and sizes. Um, but as you need more precision and complexity, the tools are changing. So additive manufacturing or 3D printing, um, they used to be exclusively, say, rigid materials. And gradually there's been a progression of um, increasingly good, flexible and soft materials that you can print. So it gives you the scope to do things, um, more interesting designs or more flexible designs that you couldn't have done uh, before. So that area of, of materials innovation has really kind of helped spur the field on. Excellent. Well, let's explore that with you, Richard. Um, obviously, you are sort of running an innovation studio and, and looking at design, uh, product design from that perspective. What's your interest in soft robotics and what have you seen happen in a sort of a field, either from a product ambition or from a commercial perspective over the last few years? Yeah, so I think as an innovation studio, we've got a, an obligation to Scan, scan the horizon with useful technologies. And I think soft robotics is a good example of this, that um, it's starting to really mature and be very useful. So our interest is, as it matures, is how do we use that technology for product design and innovation within health technologies, within agricultural technologies? Um, so I'm interested in how that technology disseminates into a solution for people to make their lives better um, and I think that it's a really interesting space I think there's lots of things that are happening at the same time over the next few years where um, 
our lives are going to be easier. So for example, you know, soft robotics for grasping soft objects, you know, as well as the Amazon kind of analogy, you've got agri agricultural technologies. So I'm kind of, you know, I think I'm interested in, in all of that space in terms of how do we actually use it? Okay. We'll come back to a little bit more about what you're seeing at the, at the moment uh, shortly, but, um, but Pete, going back to you, um, in the fields of soft robotics then, um, what kind of has had the most impact and what areas are being explored as a game changer? I can see from a commercial point of view that Amazon have got a real requirement um, and that's a fulfillment center kind of requirement. What about in, in the field of day-to-day -day life? You know, what are you seeing that might be a big game changer that, that's really exciting? No, I think, I mean, it, it kind of links to my own area of, um, of interest, but healthcare is, is a huge kind of, there's huge potential in that field because um, inherently you need systems that can work with the human body. So lots of people are researching um, assistive technologies, um, which can be used to say augment the, the human body. So if you'd had a stroke and you were um, weak on one side in terms of needing more control or support, say on, on the upper limb or maybe with walking, there's the potential for soft robotic systems to uh, help support you, um, make your movement smoother, potentially boost your strength, um, looking at things like wearable gloves that can do the same. So there's all these technologies that can actually kind of fit around your body, fit with your body um, and operate effectively with it. And I think some of those are really exciting kind of avenues that we're starting to be able to go down now. Um, there's also, and I think it sort of comes into more of the realms of future research, but is, is absolutely being kind of undertaken is putting these systems inside the body as well. So not just one on the outside, but looking to have systems for surgery or implantable robotic systems, which are soft, um, that can be used to help diagnose or actually intervene uh, and improve healthcare. Wow. Would you say healthcare is probably the biggest uh, potential benefactor of, of uh, soft robotics in sort of the next 10 years or so? I mean, obviously, you know, distribution and fulfillment centers like Amazon commercially, but, you know, would you say healthcare is where a lot of focus is on? Absolutely, yeah. There's so many different opportunities, but the physical interaction with the human body um, in terms of assistive technology and rehabilitation is huge, but then also the surgical angle as well. I mean, surgical robotic systems exist, um, the commercial systems at the moment are predominantly rigid, large systems which are, use rigid instrumentation, much like a handheld surgeon uh, would use. But they're, they're limited in the, in the ways in which they can interact with the human body. So um, researchers um, just down the road from us uh, in the surgical robotics lab are looking at things like uh, magnetically controlled soft robots that can... Uh, navigate within the human body, going down things like um, the lungs or down small blood vessels. Things you couldn't do with a rigid robot uh, are starting to be investigated and are actually a possibility um, with soft robotics. Wow. I mean, that does, to me, sound like science fiction, but it, these things are, rarely are. You know, the, the, if the research is going into them because people feel that the outcome is is within reach, I guess, given you know, materials development and all things that go with that, really, I guess, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think the, the, the pace of um, development, um, but also the, the need, you know, in terms of the clinical need, some of the challenges that people are looking at addressing now are more and more complex, and you need these innovative solutions to kind of approach them and address them. So there's definitely a need. It's not just, um, I suppose sometimes the worry is it's an academic pursuit. People are doing it for its own sake, but there's absolutely a need and a potential for the technology uh, to translate. Okay, excellent. We touched on materials earlier. Um, you mentioned silicons and various other sort of soft soft materials. Are there any developments around materials ha happening separately to the soft robotics themselves, where? You know, you may see something um, coming out of research in that particular field that's going to make a big difference. Well, yeah, linking with um, that healthcare angle, um, not exclusively, but uh, other materials. So we have things like hydrogels. So you, you can think of them almost like a jelly, you know, that's that's set. But thing, materials which are biocompatible, 
if you're going to work with the human body or with biological organisms, you need materials which are compatible, particularly if you're going to put them inside the human body. So there's a big emphasis on, on materials which will be biocompatible uh, and can operate within the human body. Some researchers have also looked at some really fascinating stuff um, where you, know, you don't view a robot as being around for a long time, but actually it might dissolve over time. So you could have something which could degrade. So you know, the, the opportunities for things like that are starting to be explored. And, and that is really, you know, again, it's, it's really exciting and really kind of interesting um, to explore what, what you could do if you could put something inside the body that lasted for a week helped you monitor that patient and then it would naturally kind of disperse it gives you different angles and ways to treat people i'm sure our audience's ears are pricking up at the uh, the very scale of, of um kind of aspiration for this uh richard in terms of the innovation side of things and and working product development as, as you do at pvm is it too early to see stuff coming through yet for you at a product development and design stage? You know, where do you think you might be in, the, in that sort of cycle, really? No, I don't think so. I think with what we do, it's always good to know what's on the horizon. The really great thing is um, our links with the University of Leeds uh, gives us really good insight in terms of what is achievable. And the things we're talking about are actually achievable. And it kind of blows my mind that we are able to do this kind of stuff. My interest is in what piece of research is useful and commercially viable and what do we actually do with it. So, you know, working with academics is, is really good from that perspective because it's trying to establish what piece of technology is going to be good for the widest audience. Um, so we're talking about precision medical, you know, where precision medicine where people need to have that bespoke care um, that's in the medical applications but also biotech you know um, you know robots that pick strawberries so it's got that agility of being able to intelligently know when to pick a strawberry and you know when it's right but when it actually picks it it doesn't damage it and you know all of these things are absolutely achievable I'm, I'm interested in that that kind of area of, of work which is actually how to make it useful you know where to how to pick the winners and and then we're working with our clients in terms of being the segue between that research piece and something which is commercially viable it's the commercial viability at your end isn't it really I, i'm going to go back a step uh, pete and just only I'm, I'm really fascinated about who drives the innovation then is it the researchers researching something that they're fascinated in and then finding a market for it or is it coming out of the sort of the medic in your sector i guess the medical sector saying this is what we would love to happen. Can you go and kind of find out whether it's possible? Where, who's driving the, who's driving the bus, Pete, on this? Is it, I think it's an interesting one. And I think it's a bit of both, not to want to uh, yeah, sit on the fence, but I think there's push and pull. So um, from a research point of view, you often get, I wouldn't call it completely blue sky, but you get research into things. Um, say, for example, we in our lab, we've been interested in developing new sensors which use soft materials um, with a, um, an overall notion that they could be used in healthcare, but no specific particular application. And, and we'll develop that and go down that route. How do we make them? How do we um, get data from them? All that kind of thing. You know, How do we design them effectively? And then from the healthcare side, or if you like, from the customer side, once you start to get to a point at which you think, this could be useful. You can start having those conversations. You know, what are the clinical needs, or what are the what are the particular requirements that are coming up that might fit that kind of technology? So it's a bit of both. And as as the field progresses, um, you see a fit for some of the, the technology that's coming through. Um, so I think from a from an academic's point of view, it's working with people. Um, like Richard and, and PDM to get an understanding maybe of where the commercial need is uh, and how to translate that technology that's really important. Um, the last thing I want to do is develop something that is never going to see you know, use in the real world. So you have to keep an eye on that side of things. We do a lot of work with um, the teaching hospitals in Leeds. Again, kind of keeping your eye on where the applications might be and also kind of 
telling people about what you do and they might see the the potential or the need for it where you you perhaps haven't so i think it's that dialogue and communication that is push and pull which is definitely a triangular center of excellence isn't it between the university between the teaching hospitals and between organizations like pdm and I think you've all got the same end game in mind, haven't you? You know, uh, you researching, looking at the practical applications within the teaching hospitals and, and, and Richard and the team, you know, looking at commercial reality and, and you know, how that would how that would would transform itself. Um, just going back from the time you were doing your initial research and then right through to now, is there something that you are really proud of that you've seen that you think, you know, in 2007, this wasn't even, you know, this was science fiction and, and yet here we are now. What, what's the what's the light bulb that you think really proud that that's happened? And it was it was it was it was just a, a pipe dream. So so many years ago. So from the research that I've uh, worked on and led, I think we've been looking increasingly at kind of sensing systems that can be used for healthcare, um, and using soft robotics principles, if you like. So we're, we've been making um, load sensors, so sensors that, that pick up force um, in different directions. Uh, and we've gone down this route of, um, first of all, seeing if we can make them at low cost, because traditionally they can be quite expensive. Can we make them robust? And then can we scale them and fit them into applications where there's a, a real healthcare need? And that's been something where um, we've been able to take a concept and go all the way through to we're working with some uh, clinicians looking at uh, diabetic foot assessment at the moment so in diabetes you're increasingly um, at risk of developing ulcers in your in your feet due to changes in your vascular system uh, as a result of the disease so monitoring your foot health is really important um, and the way we're trying to do it is to embed sensors within insoles so that we can pick up changes in the loading patterns on your foot. So I think if I'd have looked back at say PhD times and thought that's what I'd be doing or that's what I'd be able to do, I would have thought it was a pipe dream, but now we're kind of gradually incrementally kind of making the, the, the research advances that we need to do that. And it's, yeah, that's really exciting actually. And it's, it's only because we can work as a big team that we can do that really. Okay. Richard, what's your view on that then in terms of, seeing the development. I know it's a bit early in the cycle for you to be getting some practical applications coming through and requests for that. You know, how excited are you about sort of soft robotics in the commercial world then? Uh, very, because I think I think it's a potential game changer. I mean, robotics have been with us for a very long time, but as Pete mentioned, you know, kind of hard robotics that are kind of pretty dumb, really. I think that with uh, things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, combine that with soft robotics, then you've got a real powerful technology at your hands. Um, so we, and that is completely agile. So we're not talking about robots traditionally that are kind of building cars. We're talking about miniature systems that can go inside people's bodies to perform bespoke applications for tailored patient healthcare. Um, I think it's a, you know, kind of really interesting time. It's all about, you know, in the medical technology kind of world, it's all about preventive medicine, you know, if possible. And if soft robotics can, can enable that, then it's going to make life a lot easier for everybody in, in terms of the economy, let alone anything else. Excellent. So it's not it's not just the exciting applications, it's the actual practical, commercial, and, and the political impact of, of, of getting these right, I guess. So, so Pete, let's talk about somebody who is fascinated by this, wants to go on a study path, wants to get involved in the whole field of, of, of research and study at the University of Leeds. Um, how do they get into it and, and what sort of support, what would it look like if I'm you know, a student who's just been switched on to this whole kind of raft of exciting new, uh, new ventures? So that, I mean, it's one of those areas in fact, which is exciting, but also quite um, easy to, to explore actually. So you could, from a, you could get into some of the early stages as a hobbyist. Um, you could look, um, there's a couple of books I can recommend and we can maybe link to mm -hmm. um, where you can make simple self, uh, soft robotic systems in your home. You know, it's not particularly complex to make a, a simple soft robot just to sort of explore and, 
and kind of see what what can be done. Uh, and there's some really good websites as well, which sort of showcase um, state of the art technology and kind of link in. And so you can see the research that's being done at the moment. Um, then I would recommend coming to the public events that are held by the university, um, see the, the work that researchers are doing at the university. And then um, it's often uh, those events where you can kind of get an idea and actually speak to the researchers uh, that do the work. Um, and I would really recommend events like that. So uh, there's an event called Be Curious, which is held every year at the university, which is excellent. Um, and there's a, another website which is good called the Soft Robotics Toolkit. And again, it's aimed at researchers, but equally people um, who are just getting into robotic systems. And it's very open for people to get, in, get involved, use free tools, free software, and really explore what can be done. So I'd say um, investigate, kind of um, have a look, and you know, I think try it, try it for yourself. The, the real thing about robotics is having a go. Um, if you've done Lego, Technic Lego, you've already made that first start. Build on it from there. Excellent. I'm not sure anything I build, I'd want to put inside anybody's body, to be fair. My Lego's building skills as a kid were legendarily poor, to be fair. Um, <laughs> I quite like the idea, though, of, of, of resources out there. We will link um, the resources that you share with us into the show notes so people can find them. Um, I guess, Richard, from a, a point of view of, of an employer, of, of people coming out of university into sort of an innovation design studio, um, where do you see the disciplines of soft robotics and people who study this particular area being of, of, of value to you as an employer, you know, is it now, is it a little bit further down the, down the line? What would you expect to, to see from that? What, how does it work for you? I think it works for us in terms of keeping an eye on the technology and being mature um, and it being cost effective. So we spoke about med tech and uh, agri tech, but I think there are industrial applications where soft robotics will be useful. So almost like the, the next generation of what is currently you know hard robotics so i think it's a you know whether soft robotics will will be the new will replace you know the more traditional hard robotics i'm not quite sure but i think that you know if you've got somebody that's interested in soft robotics and the commercialization process and seeing the journey through from a, a research setting through through to a physical product that's the thing that we're interested in and i think as time moves on you know we're interested in Okay, so how do we actually commercialize that? You know, who do we need to talk to, you know, as potential collaborative partners, you know, in terms of agritech or vertical farming, you know, what are their what are their needs and wants? Is it to do with labor shortages or is it to do with efficiencies? You know, and how do we then use this technology and make it useful for for clients, you know, for, for industry basically? So I think anybody that's got a really interested in it and seeing it through is is kind of where we're at. And I think that we're very close to it, you know, in terms of having those conversations. So it's not tomorrow's world, it's today's world, isn't it? Very much so, I would guess. The tomorrow's world reference being for people of a of a certain vintage who are listening or watching this video, uh, this uh, podcast. So last question, I guess, Pete, for you is, um, and it's only a curious question from me, really. You've got soft robotics, you've got artificial intelligence, you've got augmented reality, and the whole thing clashing together in a positive way to 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 change the game really in healthcare um, uh, um support really i think so yeah i mean it's interesting how they kind of complement each other so things like soft robotics um the systems that you can develop um can be quite complex and if you think about things like if they if they measure things from the real world you increasingly uh, you'll know from your mobile phone have increasing amounts of data uh, and sensors can be put anywhere, but you need something to make sense of those signals. So machine intelligence is perfect for that. You have complex mechanical systems which can be deformed and embed lots of sensors. So mm. machine intelligence is that kind of mechanism by which you can understand what's going on and make sense of it. Um, and then things like augmented reality, um, you need to, give that information to a human at some point and so that provides you with that way of kind of communicating what's quite a complex set of information to the to the human um so that's that's the kind of the way i see them all linking up you know that they can complement each other 
but they need good design along the way because there's all along with the potential for it to be good there's also the potential for it to go very very wrong if you don't do it well so making sure you design and follow the right kind of design principles is absolutely essential in that kind of run through i'm sure richard would uh, would echo that as well richard wouldn't you from uh, from a pdm international perspective yeah it's something i always talk about it's not what it is it's what it does so you've got a great technology but the the really important thing is to think about the user and how that be, how that technology becomes useful to the user and not to get wrapped up in the technology that's the that's a real differentiator yeah listen guys this this has flown time has flown by uh, i think it's fair to say that this is very much a landscape that our audience are want to keep an eye on and see developments and and pete will wish you well with everything's happening in healthcare mechatronics at the university all that remains for me to say at this stage is apart from thank you for being a fantastic guest and and sort of blowing my mind a little bit as a as a kind of not only where you've come from but where we're going uh is to say that this has been from the studio from pdm international we're a, um, an innovation and design studio based in thirsk in north yorkshire and also in leeds and our contact details for those who watch the video on uh, the podcast will be on the screen. If not, we'll put them in the show notes. But uh, thank you very much again, uh, uh, Pete. Thanks for your um, fantastic insights. And, and Richard, again, thanks for co-hosting. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Cheers.